I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now and forever. <clears throat> Welcome once again, everyone, to the next episode in the Healing Wounds of Christ, offered as a directed retreat by the Reverend Joseph Henshi of the Congregation of the Sacred Stigmata. So welcome again, Father. Welcome to you, Lisa. Thank you for coming. And this is the day the Lord has Let made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. Alleluia. Alleluia. So another good day. Uh, it's good to be together again and to continue our talk about the Sacred Heart Devotion. Mm-hmm. So what will you share with us today? Well, today I'll begin with reflections on the Sacred Heart Devotion and Eternal Life. I don't mean this to be a conference in canon law to talk about the the, devo- the um, merits of the devotion of the Sacred Heart, but simply that it's geared towards it. It's like we're getting in practice to live eternally the love of God. So it's kind of a, a learning lesson that we need to read the different passage of Scripture and to see what God God's love means and how we should live it on earth as a preparation for heaven. So it's the eschatological dimension of the devotion of the Sacred Heart. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, will you begin us with a prayer then today? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Father, I'll let you take it away. So pick up where we left off yesterday with Romans 8, verses 28 and following. So Paul here clearly offers a glimpse of the great plan of loving providence offered by God. We know, as when he writes these beautiful words, we know that by turning everything to their good, God cooperates with all those who love him, with all those he has called according to his purpose. They are the ones that he chose long ago, specially, and intended them to become true icons or images of his son, so that his son might be called the eldest of many brothers and sisters, so that when the harvest is complete, we will be a part of it. So this is the eschatological dimension of God's love we love here on earth to spend eternity in this exercise. This plan does not exhaust itself in this world, as we see in that same Romans 8.30. With those he justified, God has shared his own glory. This is the ultimate expression of divine love. As we know, God did not have to create. But with the old philosophical principle, all goodness is diffusive of itself, and the greater the goodness, the more energy there is in that diffusion. So the diffusion of God's glory will be shared for all eternity if, as we exercise his love on earth and in heaven. So this is the ultimate expression of divine love. This is the supreme mercy, that of glorification, confirmation in grace, eternal justification, without any fear of losing it again. There's a time of no more death, no more sadness. The world of the past is gone, and the new world comes. So this is never given for merits alone, but it is the expression of a superabundant pouring out of God's grace, mercy, and love. So this gift of God, manifested in the symbol of the Sacred Heart, renders humanity, lowly humanity, eternally inseparable from the Trinity, will never be separated again. As again we read in that same very powerful Romans 8, nothing, therefore, can ever come between us and the love of Christ, even if we are troubled or worried or being persecuted, lacking food or clothes, being threatened or attacked. These are the trials through which we triumph by the power of the one who has loved us. I am certain of this, that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor prince, nothing that exists, 
nothing still to come, not any power or height or depth, nor any created thing can ever come between us and the love of God made visible in Christ Jesus our Lord. It seems that Paul meant that also in this life. He was so convinced of following Christ, he felt that nothing on earth was really a match for God's grace, although he knew he could always reject it. So the superabundant love within the Trinity, that yearning in God himself to offer glorification to believers, is ably represented, manifested by the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In my own life, I knew a man once who always had something funny to say. And when you were approaching, you could see him e eager to tell you this story. <laughs> he was a delight to me. Yeah. And it's something like that that turned me so eager to share this eternal love with all of us. So all those who share in the divine nature, is a word from Second Peter 1.4, also will share in the eternal love and mercy of the Trinity, and they are invited through life to express this devotion by imitation, by accepting pardon, by extending his mercy through forgiveness of others. <clears throat> the promise of an eternal union with God has inspired the Church through all the centuries, as we read in 1 Corinthians 13. Now we are seeing a dim reflection as in a mirror, but then we shall be focusing face to face. The knowledge that I now have is imperfect, but then I shall know as fully as I am known, 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve in that great hymn of charity. The promise of eternal glory is simply the promise of a fulfilled friendship, filiation, that God makes to those who remain devoted, imitating his forgiving love. Just recently I contacted a person <clears throat> whom I knew in high school and hadn't seen or heard from him for her at least in 70 years. It was the most remarkable, one of the most remarkable experiences. We picked right off where we left where off. Where you left off. We weren't intimate friends, but we certainly knew who each other was, and <clears throat> we always had a quip for each other to make the day a little louder. So it's just something like that that we experience with the Lord. The state of glory is nothing more than the perfect flowering of present grace. It gave me an idea what heaven must be. Hey, nice to see you. Welcome home. <laughs> what kept you? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, these are all veiled images, of course, but it gives some idea, I think, that the love that people have for one another, all kinds of love, friendly, fraternal, sponsor, filial, and so on. <clears throat> well, it's one of the... The things that they they give us in in hospice, a sort mm. of a, a bit sentimental, but to give mm. people a sense of what you're talking mm. about, and uh, and they say that when people die, mm -hmm. it's it's as if they're on a ship going across yeah. an yeah. ocean, mm -hmm. and their the loved ones are waving goodbye, yeah. mm -hmm. and as they get out of sight, they turn mm. to face the other way, and all their loved ones are waving Wait hello. <laughs> That's right. Welcome home. Welcome I heard home. a priest give that, uh, Stigmatine Father Gorgon, gave that image beautifully in a homily for one of his deceased uh, classmates. It was really well. It's the first I heard it, and this is the first time since. It's a very nice image. It is. But you say the departure from is in admission in, toward or journey toward. Yes, or the other one that I've heard is that when a child is born, the humans rejoice mm -hmm. and the angels weep. Yeah. And then when someone dies, the humans a, weep uh, and the angels uh, rejoice. The angels rejoice. Uh, anyway, this state of glory then is the perfect flowering of present grace, deposited in us through the sacraments, infused in us by the Holy Spirit. It is in this way that we have our initial contact with the Most Blessed Trinity, largely in our Catholic faith through the sacraments. But as we know, always do. Whoever does what he or she can, God does not deny the grace. So this face-to-face -face vision is also presented to us in 1045 of the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church. The face-to-face -face vision, which is contact with the Trinity, is reserved for eternity. This presupposes a gradual assimilation of divine grace by responding to the daily challenges of life. In this adherence, an eventual assimilation with the Trinity is the core of all eternity. For us, this consummation will be the final realization of the unity of the human race 
which God willed from creation and of which the pilgrim church has been in the nature of a sacrament, those who are united with Christ will form the community of the redeemed, the holy city of God, the bride, the wife of the Lamb. She will not be wounded any longer by sin, stains, self-love that destroy or wound the earthly community. The beatific vision in which God opens himself in an inexhaustible way to the elect will be the ever-flowing wellspring of happiness, peace, and mutual communion. Mm-hmm. We've all had the experience, the end of a perfect day. If I could remember many, many Fourth of Julys ago, maybe as many as 80, my family used to have a cookout on the Fourth of July in the rocks by the side of the beach, and we would start six, seven o'clock, so we would be there still when the sun went down. It was one of those memories where you the old and young, it was my father's business associates who would come down from their annual trip. It really was a very pleasant time. I remember I used to worry about them getting home oh. <laughs> after all those hot dogs and, and flapjack. There was not much drinking going on in my family, I can assure you, but it was just a very, very pleasant, pleasant experience. Pleasant day. Yeah, we want to mm. hang on to yeah, those, those perfect days. Yeah, it's just like at the end of a perfect day, my father would always say when everybody was gone. So thanks to this beatific vision, the ideal identity and the affective assimilation of the believer to the most blessed trinity perfects human intelligence and the wills of the elect by bestowing on them the only satisfying objects of their lifelong quest were in a frantic search of improvement. And that can be a very healthy thing as long as we know that this can only come from us by God. We get from God as much as we did or hope from Him. So in this glorified adherence and assimilation, there's always a fusion of minds and hearts with the Trinitarian mystery of life and glory. I think this is what affected a lot of us in our young, young years, and hearing these great masses of theology which were being revealed and manifested to us for the first time. But there was a great sense of that homeness. This really mm-hmm. is right. A, a sharing of the mind of these giants and us little pygmies sitting in the benches t- trying to take notes of this stuff rattling off them as out of great, with great love and great respect as I remember. So in the end, the infinite mercy of the Trinity will be enthroned in the human heart in response to the outpouring of the Sacred Heart. Again, it is St. John who offers us a deeper appreciation of that final transfiguration and that shared in divinization, the fruit of the believer's lifelong effort to live merciful charity in accordance with his superabundant grace. And we have this in 1 John 4, 1 and following. Think of the love that the Father has lavished on each of us by letting us be called God's children, and this is what we are. Because the world refuses to acknowledge him, therefore it does not acknowledge us. My dear people, we are already the children of God, but what we are to be in the future has not yet been revealed. All we know is that when it is revealed, We shall be like him because we shall see him as he really is. That's the famous noch nit, not yet, or ja and non ancora. Siamo già figli di Dio, ma non ancora tutto ciò che potremmo essere. Anyway, we're not yet all that we still can be. Yes, and for our listeners, that first one was German and the second one was Italian there. More or less. (laughs) More or less. Broken Italian and smitted, smattered in German. The new catechism hold out, holds out this hope to us in number 2548. It's a very beautiful section to study or even to read or to meditate on in a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament. Just take the Creed or, or Life in Christ or the seven, the, the, uh, the seven Sacraments or the Petitions of the Our Father. Faith makes us taste in advance the light of the beatific vision, the goal of our journey here below. Here we shall see God face to face. So faith is already the beginning of eternal life. Fides in coatio vita eterni. New Catechism 163. And again, 2548. Desire for true happiness frees one from a moderate attachment to goods in this world so that each one can find fulfillment in the vision and the beatitude of God. 
the promise of seeing God surpasses all beatitude. In Scripture, to see is to possess. Whoever sees God has already obtained all the goods of which he can conceive, to 548. And again, Augustine quoted by the Catechism 2550, there will be true glory. Um, there will be true glory when no one is praised by mistake or flattery. True honor will not be refused to the worthy, nor granted to the unworthy. I remember once having the unhappy experience of seeing somebody cheat in an exam. Ah. And then he won an award. Oh. It made me feel sorry for the teacher in a way, and uh, certainly was not a happy thought about my friend. But anyway, <clears throat> hopefully he's with the Lord in, in peace and his mercy. No one unworthy will ever pretend to be worthy, where only those who are worthy will be admitted. <clears throat> How sad it is to see somebody disgraced later in life having to give back some of the awards he or she won earlier in life. This is sometimes a real humiliation, and maybe for their eternal benefit it's a good thing, but it's a very tragic thing to see. There, true peace will reign, when no one will experience opposition either for himself or for others. God himself will be virtue's reward. He gives virtue, and he has promised to give himself as the best and part of greatest reward that could exist. I shall be their God. They shall be my people. This is also the meaning of the Apostle's word, so that God may be all in all. God himself will be the goal for our desires. We shall contemplate him without end and love him without fate, praise him without weariness. This gift, this state, this act, like eternal life itself, will be common to all who are present in eternal life. Well, you know, as you talk about this uh-huh. idea of the beatific vision and seeing God face to face, yesterday in your reflection, you talked about heaven being the place where where everyone is perfected, mm-hmm. you know, have mm-hmm. they've reached perfection. Mm-hmm. And so since then, I've been thinking uh, about, yes, seeing others that I know mm-hmm. perfected, mm-hmm. But I'm very curious to see myself perfected. <laughs> I wonder what I was, I would be perfected. Well, that, that's a good thing to look forward to. Oh, well, and, and you know, too, that, that what, as I've been meditating on this, I, I think about other people I know, especially mm-hmm. elderly people yeah. or people who are dying, and I think mm-hmm. I can begin to see the perfection mm-hmm. in them, um, yeah. the, the gentleness, sure. the the humility, the Those receptivity, the you know yeah. that kind of thing, mm-hmm. and I think, well, my goodness, will that mm-hmm. will that be me someday? And maybe, mm-hmm. maybe if I cooperate more with the grace of God in this life, I could get a little closer to that. Well, that that's while I'm still around here, that's the purpose of it all. You know how it all is. We unfortunately sometimes with our lack of charity, he's all right, but there's yeah. always a but. Well, in heaven they won't be. Yeah. All the butts are gone. <laughs> so St. Thomas invites us to admire, to adore, and to follow the persons in the Trinity, especially the Father and the Son, sent into this world with visible and invisible missions. The Trinity is totally present in the souls of the just, being sanctified through grace, grace, charity, and wisdom. These become causes of our response and not only models of our response. They lead us to intensify our response to grace, to charity, to wisdom, to configure ourselves to cooperate more in this lifelong process of con naturality. We were given the seed of it at baptism. We are infused with the nature of the Lord, and the more we heed his word more and more is that nature of God within us intensified to be more and more assimilated by the Most Blessed Trinity in the hopes of reaching an eternal goal. So this process of assimilation to the divine nature and to the eternal processions of the Word and the Holy Spirit gradually achieves maturation in the very being of the human soul, as well as permeating each person's intellect and will in proportion to the gradual development of grace, the intensification of charity, the more intelligent and loving use of wisdom. We can use wisdom to astound people or to show them how much we know, 
It's no longer wisdom, because wisdom must be humble and charity, charity, full of charity and loving, leading someone to God. Yes, that first kind is more like cleverness, isn't it? It is, it? yeah, it's wiliness. And, wiliness, yeah, 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 that's something yeah. that calls attention to itself. itself. And this is not wisdom. Not wisdom. Not wisdom, no. These are the divine realities that will remain forever, while faith and hope and all the charisms described from St. Paul will cease to function once we get into paradise. Paul puts it this way, and again, in that hymn of charity, 1 Corinthians 13, Love does not come to an end, but if there are gifts of prophecy, the time will come when they must fail. If there's a gift of languages, it will not continue forever. And even knowledge of this too, the time will come when it must fail. I think this is a living experience of anyone who has ever studied. <laughs> Going into theology my first day, this was a new chapter in formation. And almost every day there was a whole new insight. So where would that come from? Mm-hmm. All I had known before that maybe was the Baltimore Catechism or those wonderful lessons of the old dear cynical nuns in the Brighton Convent in, in uh, Massachusetts. Our knowledge is imperfect, uh, imperfect, and our prophesying is imperfect. But once perfection comes, all imperfection will disappear. And that's a big challenge of, of uh, Hebrews. All of our imperfections will disappear when we are celebrating that perfect sacrifice of thanksgiving in the celestial sanctuary for all eternity. So the permanence of grace, charity, and wisdom in the soul establishes a unity with the Trinity. I think a lot of us are like those professional ball players who say some days they were more up for a game than mm-hmm. on others. And there are some days we are really plowing through life, enjoying a given day or a lot of joy and maybe consolation or whatever. But eventually this becomes eternal. So there is a cohabitation, an inhabitation in a common communion of thought, a connaturality of yearning, all of which is substantial similarity and which is a sign of everlasting life. For indeed, we are not ignorant of the fact of this profound truth of the union, of our union with the divine Redeemer, and in particular of the indwelling of the most blessed Holy Spirit in our souls. This is shrouded in darkness by many a veil now that impedes our power to understand and explain it, both because of the hidden nature of the doctrine itself and the limitations of our human intellect. This is an interesting point. Why, in addition to the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love, do we also need the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. Well, there's an immediate twofold reason. On the one hand, faith, hope, and charity have God as their immediate object. Well, there's no imagery we have in the human intellect to put them in there. It's like the hole in the beach. So we need these gifts to help us to understand what we read or experience by divine revelation. And secondly, our wills have been weakened and our minds have been darkened by sin, original and personal. So we do need this additional help to respond no longer in a human manner, but in a divine manner to these urgings of the Holy Spirit. We know, too, that from well-directed and earnest study of this doctrine and from the clash of many different opinions, and the discussion thereof, provided that these are regulated by the love of truth and due submission to the Church, much light will be gained, which in its turn will help into progress, help us to progress in kindred sacred sciences. This is the development of a theologian. While the th- not theological knowledge is not necessary for eternal salvation, but for anyone who does try to cultivate it, it certainly has an impact in our eternal life. As, as the old Thomas used to say, theological knowledge knowledge could be an, intellect, an accidental intellectual attribute for eternity. So we do not censure those who in various ways with diverse reasonings make every effort to understand or to clarify the mystery of this wonderful union with Christ. And of course this is what grace is or this is what charity is. And we're all all old students of theology are familiar with that famous time, supposedly, I hope it's not apocryphal, I heard it from everybody, when the Jesuits and the Dominicans were arguing on a late August afternoon before an elderly, venerable, and back holy father, 
whether the theology of grace was primotio physica, physical primosin, or whether it was cooperation and so on. And they both, they argued all day. And each one had a half hour and the Pope would listen and turn to the next and back and forth and back and forth. So they looked up as the story calls for the final conclusion and His Holiness was in papal slumber, <laughs> dead asleep. So it was never resolved, this truth in both aspects. But let all agree uncompro- uncompromisingly in this. If they would not err from the truth and from the orthodox teaching of the Church, to reject every kind of mystical union by which the faith of Christ should in any way pass beyond the sphere of creatures and wrongly enter the divine, were it only to the extent of appropriating to themselves as their own but one single attribute of the Godhead, I am God. And that's why we cringe a little bit when we read Paul, imitate me mm-hmm. as I have imitated God. Now that can be readily understood, but No one of us would appropriate to ourselves any such mystical union and believe that it was was true. Oh, now I understand. You understand another dimension, but it's still a long way to temporary. Yeah, well, when I read that, too, um, I always think about about the the way an apprentice imitates a master. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. not like the master's mastery Mm -hmm. is complete. No. There's always more to learn, mm-hmm. more to gain. Mm-hmm. and But by imitating the Master, anyone who is farther ahead of you mm-hmm. has something has yeah. something to definitely to offer. It is. It would seem to be a good uh, example of the Christian life and its ministry. Those relay races where you run your bit yeah. and hand it out to someone else and they continue maybe run better than you do. Anyway, all of these beautiful terms are from Pope Pius XII in his document, Mystici Corporis, which he wrote during the war, frightfully, frightfully saddened and, and, and shocked by the terribly cruel World War II, where Christian nations were destroying and committing atrocities one against the other. He wrote this beautiful letter in 1943, The Mystical Body of Christ. And in that he tells us that war is a scandal, and we'll be a long time paying the price of the scandal of cruelty to other human beings. So the Pope continues, it must be borne in mind that there is question here of a hidden mystery. During our entire earthly exile, this can only be dimly seen through a veil which no human words can express. The divine persons are said to indwell as much as they are present, (coughs) as they are present beings endowed with intelligence in a way that lies beyond human comprehension and in a unique and very intimate manner which transcends all created nature, these creatures enter into relationship with them through knowledge and love. How do we describe the indwelling of the Trinity? Is it marriage? Is it pregnancy? Beyond both. So we have no image to describe this deep union. He doesn't annihilate us, but he indwells in us in his totality and fullness, always urging us on to share more in this divine, this divine gift. If we would attain in some measure to a clearer perception of this truth, let us never neglect the method recommended strongly by the First Vatican Council in similar cases by which these mysteries are compared with one another and with the end which they, toward which they are directed so that in the light which this comparison throws on them we are able to discern at least, at least somewhat the hidden things of God. The famous arcane uh, there was, even in the catechetical exercise of the church, people would be introduced in a general way to the creed. But then there'd become a time when they were more gradually in, in, initiated into the deeper things. Mm-hmm. We, some churches, parishes, tried to imitate that by having the little children stay up until the homily. Right. And they would leave and go and have their own little uh, instruction it was an old remnant. I mean, the practical reason was that they could speak more on the level of the child during a kind of a catechism lesson until communion time. But it did take them from the Mass, so it wasn't always 100% um, willed, but it did um, uh, good things. But the arcane, the hidden things of God, we are grappling with those, as we often say in homilies or say in our own minds, 
what is it that has it all about, Alfie? What, mm-hmm. what does this all mean? I think we have expressions of that when we are confronted with a real tragedy or even a, a brilliant happiness, some mm-hmm. wonderful thing that happens to us. We wonder how this is meant for me or why, what am I supposed to do with this and so on. Well, you know, when you mention these things, these mysteries that are the arcane, Mm -hmm. some time back I went to an art exhibit Mm -hmm. um, where the art was Buddhist art. Mm -hmm. So it was Asian, Mm -hmm. uh, I think, Chinese or Japanese Buddhist art. And there was a, a scroll or a painting. And the title of it was The Advanced Monks Being initiated into the deeper mysteries. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, it was just a painting Mm -hmm. of a guy standing around, but the title of it really Mm -hmm. enchanted me because there there were clearly mysteries Mm -hmm. that were saved Mm -hmm. for explanation to people Mm -hmm. once they had reached a level of advancement. Mm -hmm. And it made me wonder, too, in the Bible, Jesus says, I, I... I speak to the people mm-hmm. in parables, but I can speak to you, mm-hmm. the disciples, mm-hmm. in a different way. And I've always wondered, what was he telling the disciples well, that he I, didn't tell yeah. other people? Or how did he explain it? So that that sense of there being a deeper mystery, mm-hmm. an inner veil, mm-hmm. um, has always been fascinating. Well, it, it is, and I think we have to be a little bit careful how we interpret it, that the Lord gave special secrets to the apostles on the hierarchical church. Everyone is open to these things. But as the Lord says, I could not reveal it all to you now, but it will come in time. The Holy Spirit needs to teach us all things that Jesus has revealed to us. So it's a work of a lifetime and leads to everlasting life. But that's what it is. It's what we we just don't get it all now. We still need to ponder, to pray, and so on. And that's why, as Cardinal Newman would say, a thousand difficulties don't make one doubt. Right, right. We don't have the immediate answer to it. We don't know what heaven is. Eye is not seen nor ear. We don't know how many would be saved, the, the majority or the minority, even though the present opinion, I think, from Pope Benedict on, we think the majority may be saved. But we don't know. That's yeah. all in God's plan. And I didn't mean so much that... that Jesus told mm, the disciples mm, special things mm, he didn't tell anyone else. Mm, but maybe because of their more mature mm, development, he mm, was able to talk about it in right. a way that was different than the way he talked to the that's less right. initiated. And to lead them forward to continue his teaching right, after right. his ascension. But you've had mm. that experience, I'm sure. I right. have too, mm. where after you, you, you have something and suddenly now you have an insight mm-hmm that you didn't have before. Mm-hmm. You think, I've been a Christian all my life, mm-hmm. and I knew this, but how did I not really know this? Mm-hmm. And suddenly things seem to open up yeah, into sure. mm-hmm. a level of understanding that is more complete or deeper mm-hmm. or more sophisticated yeah. than you would have had otherwise. In seminary formation, this is always a great challenge. I've been part of a different uh, faculties for many years in different countries and different places and so on. And how do we draw the seminarians onward from the first year to the fourth? And that we all try to get a gradated approach to the spiritual life as we do to theology. That as the years go by, we keep tweaking a bit the seminary faculty, I mean the seminary curriculum. What's best at the end? Would it be John's Gospel and the Eucharist in the fourth year? Or would it be, I don't know, this eternal life and Mm -hmm. all of these ideas and Whatever you choose gives us a pretty good idea of what that uh, faculty is emphasizing. At any rate, this wonderful union, <clears throat> or indwelling, properly so-called, differs from that by which God embraces and gives joy to the elect only by reason of our earthly estate. And that celestial vision, it will be granted to the eyes of the human mind, strengthened by the light of glory, to contemplate the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in an utterly ineffable manner to assist to eternity at the processions of the divine person, to rejoice with the happiness like to that with which the holy and undivided trinity is happy. So these sublime words, these last this last page or so, are taken from paragraph seventy eight to eighty of Pope Pius the Twelfth. He was an absolute brilliant writer and his 
His style is sometimes contrasted or compared with St. Pope John Paul II, who was an encyclopedic writer, whereas Pope Pius XII tried to zero in with his beam, or like a, a printer or a arrow on a computer, an indicator where we are and so on. Anyway, the sacred heart of Jesus in this world is the symbol of such eternal love and mercy of the Trinity. In this symbol, the believer can ponder the history of salvation. For generations, this brings with it a singular comfort, consolation, and challenge. So these are just some thoughts about eternal life and this devotion to the most, to the sacred heart of Jesus and God's love for all of us. Sometime this, this uh, friendship will be eternal. All of us have glimpses of this. Remember, we, as children, we used to go for three months in the summer up to New Hampshire from Boston, Massachusetts. And there was another neighborhood up there. And when Labor Day would come, and the day after Labor Day, we'd all get in our cars and go back for the new school year. And it was a nostalgic time. Sure. See you next year, you know, we used to say. And it was uh, something like that. I think the glimpses we get here on earth will find fulfilled in heaven. And mm-hmm. the, the human love does not change. It's just elevated and intensified. Well, even though this is not the best order, we can now look at the Sacred Heart, and missionary spirituality. Mm -hmm. Sacred Heart devotion is not meant to be a lollipop that makes us happy or fulfills us. It's meant to inspire us and to share the great gift that we have. Much like my old friend who can hardly wait to tell you a good story. Hey, let me tell you, Mm -hmm. I heard this one today. So the first aspect of spirituality, and certainly any missionary spirituality, as we read of in Redemptoris Smithio, John Paul II, number 82, means 87, is to be docile to the Holy Spirit. I was taught that the ecclesial obedience is meant to bring us into docility to the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. If somebody cannot ever obey the church, well, he or she could never accept the Spirit. Right. Because the Spirit is not controlled by us. He breathes where he will. I might console us and so on, but every once in a while give us a bit of a jab to wake us up. So docility flows out of the real struggle with obedience that we all have. It's just not a, a natural state of, uh, of choice. Docility, docility enables the believer to be molded from within, and we might become more and more Christ-like. To reflect Christ, it is necessary to be docile. It comes to lie by the power of grace, charity, and the gift of wisdom. Docility then imparts fortitude, discernment, understanding, and knowledge. What would God want me to do? Mm -hmm. I used to always try with young nuns, especially young sisters, what does God want of your life? Not what you think you would like to do. What what do you think? And we think we could... And we'd spend a whole year of spiritual direction on trying to develop and to read good things and pray good prayers and so on, so that this eventually would become clear. Well, you know, an example of docility that's always struck me is during my years of teaching, I've had many students from India, and women Mm -hmm. um, particularly, many students from Mm -hmm. India, who still in the 21st century Mm -hmm. have parents who choose their spouses Mm -hmm. for them. Mm Now, of course, they can can reject the choice Mm -hmm. and veto it. Mm -hmm. But that kind of docility Mm -hmm. is a very alien idea Mm -hmm. that that I would kind of have as much trust Mm -hmm. as these young people Mm -hmm. do in Mm -hmm. their parents to choose wisely Mm -hmm. for them Mm -hmm. is a it's just a a kind of a metaphor for the kind of docility Mm -hmm. and trustfulness that you're speaking about. Mm -hmm. And and these young women have told me, you know, in India we believe our parents know us better mm-hmm. than we know ourselves. Mm-hmm. They know what's in our best mm-hmm. interests better than we know ourselves. Mm-hmm. And in India, we we believe that you learn to love mm-hmm. someone mm-hmm. rather than that you mm-hmm. fall in love with mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. And it's so different mm-hmm. than the way mm-hmm. in our world mm-hmm. we tend to think. At least in the mm-hmm. you know modern Western world, we don't think that way. But that that's a, a little bit like what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, there is a value 
in all of these things. We live in a country established by the Declaration of Independence, so we always look for ways to beat the law. A fuzz buster. <laughs> you get a little thing in your car when you know there's a cop up yeah, ahead. Yeah. Oh, how many times do you find some child refuses to obey some aspect of school discipline that the other 1,000 students obey, but this child takes the school system to court and wins? Yeah, yeah. That person becomes immediately, how would you like to be in school administration with this stuff going on all the mm-hmm. time? It's, it must be... Re- so this concept of docility, it doesn't mean to be sheepishness. I think... Uh, John Paul, uh, Pope Paul, in his uh, uh, what was the name of it? on the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, a devotion on Mary, and she she, she was not a, a wimp of a woman. Mm-hmm. She said, "May the mighty be overturned from their offices and turned from their thrones and so on." I just can't think of that letter of it's not Pope Paul. Fulgens Koran. It's not. No, no. that's Pius the Twelfth. There was okay. a. On uh, anyway, I can look it up later. Well, we'll so. look it up later. All right. So anyway, this missionary spirituality demands docility, demands this reading God's word and trying to accept it and understand it. <clears throat> the apostles are the outstanding examples here, even though they are often appeared unable to understand him and reluctant to follow him, particularly in carrying out the Father's plan through Gethsemane and Calvary where they fled, denied, and cursed him. Despite it all, the Son's forgiveness and the Spirit's transformation made them persevering and courageous in their witness witness even to martyrdom. So today's apostolic mission is extremely difficult. The mission today needs that apostolic creativity, boldness, and gentleness. The missionary needs to apply through the ways of the Spirit in imitating the Divine Son fulfilling the Father's plan of mercy. So an essential characteristic of missionary spirituality is intimate communion with Jesus Christ. We read this in Redemptoris Missio, paragraph 88. All needs to be carried out in relation to Jesus Christ, who was sent by the Father to evangelize. It is his mission that the Church continues. It is necessary to have the mind of Christ Jesus to feel what he felt within himself, to have his sentiments, his attitude, as we read in Philippians 2.5. I think this is what we mean when we say the priest, when he marches in on Sunday morning, he does not come to uh, be, hey, look at me, people. He comes to say, I came from you and I am for you, that his main service is to offer his witness and his work the, uh, uh, to the priesthood of the baptized. So the mystery of the incarnation and the redemption is described as a total self-emptying. The Son of God assumed a human nature which bled to death on the cross on the, in his death on the cross. By, his, by this, Christ experienced fully the human condition and the total exempt, acceptance of the Father's plan. This is an ex- em- emptying of self which is permeated by love and expresses love. The apostolic mission follows the same path and leads to the foot of the cross. It is precisely because he or she is sent that every missionary may experience the consoling presence of Jesus. The message is, do not be afraid, I am with you. Of course, my early priesthood was much different than these later years. We had the great Cardinal Archbishop of Boston who for years opened a new school every season yes, and a new parish every month. Well, now there's great closure, and it's very hard to watch city after city after city where pastors are being put in charge of two or three places yes. at the same time. It, it's a covering in a certain sense, and I know these bishops and, and diocesan committees have sweated over these decisions, but it certainly doesn't look like from the outside a great motion of improvement or mm-hmm. intensif- its intensification, but it's certainly not a numer- any numerical increase which we got too used to looking at. So missionaries need to reflect on the duty of holiness that is required of them by their very vocation. Renew themselves in spirit day by day 
and strive to live the old slogan, contemplatives in action. The missionary finds answers to problems and challenges in his prayer or her prayer in the light of God's word in personal and in shared prayer. Redemptory Smithio number 91. The saying such as putting one's heart into one's work or he or she has a lot of heart helps to understand even on the natural level the suitability of having the sacred heart as a symbol of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ in his Holy Spirit. Even to list all the benefits of this divine self-giving would be a challenge. And all of this is summarized by the sacred heart, the unity and trinity in God, the Paschal mystery in its integrity, the sacraments, first particularly the Eucharist, the most blessed sacrament, the gift of eternal life, the Blessed Mother, the saints, are all expressions of the infinite love and mercy of God. Even in the careful Thomistic theology of presenting the generation of the Word as intellectual and the spiration of the Holy Spirit as affective, there is no difficulty with the symbolism of the Sacred Heart. Primarily, of course, this is because only the second person of the Trinity became incarnate. This is the heart of Christ, bringing us into the bosom of the Trinity. It is true that Christ, in the strength of his divinity, is the Logos, the wisdom of the Father. His coming into our world is a visible mission. Theologically, it is simply a continuation, a revelation, a manifestation of his imminent, eternal, Trinitarian procession. The second person of the Most Blessed Trinity in becoming incarnate is above all else an, an, a visible manifestation of God's wisdom, even often thought of as more intellectual than effective. There is great wisdom in loving the poor, great wisdom in trying to teach people who may or may not be open to it. As a priest, I think I had great difficulty always in trying to teach catechism to the teenagers. I just had very little success there, and I it was always a regret in a way. But anyway, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is the embrace of charity. Therefore, the mission of the Spirit in our world is usually associated with the coming of divine love, inspiration, revelation, sanctification. This still would not make of the sacred heart devotion in any way out of harmony with the classical Trinitarian theology. It's just a symbol, a -hmm. sign, that reminds us of extraordinary, sublime truths. Beginning with Christ's humanity, it's clear that he has come essentially as a mediator. He has not come on his own, but to bring the Father's message. All devotion, in this sense, is in the Holy Spirit through Christ toward the Father. Devotion to the Sacred Heart does not terminate in his person, but by concomitance and consubstantiality, Jesus is God sharing divine wisdom, love, and mercy with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Jesus' human heart is also the symbol of Trinitarian love. Devotion to the sacred heart is one is one to the image and like is is made to the image and likeness of the symbol of Trinitarian love, because it is a devotion that is essentially relative in relation to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In technical terms, its sacred heart is first of all an object of absolute latria, means adoration, like all aspects of the humanity of the incarnate word, the body and blood of the Lord. So the, the sweat of Jesus is a divine action and, indi- and indicates and reveals to us profound and deep and intense love for all of us. So devotion to the sacred heart, which is the symbol of all divine love, uh, tends to be concentrated in the eternal love of all three divine presence on the force of that well-known principle enunciated by St. Thomas, anything that is directed toward the image insofar as it is an image does not terminate in the image, but rather in what the image represents. So mm-hmm. we worship statues. Mm-hmm. We don't believe that they're going to jump up and down or talk to us or wiggle their ears or the lights come on fire. We pray to them, and our prayer is brought, of course, to the uh, life of the saint or the existence of the saints in heaven, friends of God. This is found in St. Uh, Thomas's second part, question 81. 
In this sense, image and dogmatic formulations have one thing in common here. They refer more to the reality they express. It's not so much the words of the painting of the Sacred Heart and many of those sacrament things that can turn us off, as it were, but it refers to the love of God for each and every one of us, asking for the love of each of us for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So faith is more in the reality than in the statement that strives to express it. We say this all the time with St. Thomas. Faith is not in the words of the dogmatic formulation, but in the reality that they express. So we can change the formulations once in a while to clarify them in later ages, but the truth remains the same. Faith is more in the reality than in the statement that strives to express it. The worship that is rendered to the Sacred Heart has as is its term the divine person of the incarnate Word of God. Concomitantly, the other two persons of the Trinity are present wherever Jesus is present. What they share in their essence is the uncreated love in common. Through the centuries, many have found the devotion to the Sacred Heart to be a kind of a mystical ladder, a most sure and direct access to the very core of the being of God, which is merciful love. So therefore, is the devotion to the Sacred Heart necessary? No, but it has proven through the ages, through centuries, to be a great help to many, many people who get involved in it. There are many others who do not, but in no way is their path to God hindered or, or lessened or made more uh, full of obstacles. Jesus is the wisdom of the Father, the incarnate Word of God. He's not just a word. He's a divine word, a perfect expression of the Father, spirating perfect personal love. The incarnate word had a human heart, one that was sensitive, tender, supremely worthy of being assumed as a natural symbol of the love of the Most Blessed Trinity and His mercy. In like manner, Jesus Christ is a mediator, mediator Dei, Pope Pius XII, the word mediator of God. Jesus' heart enjoys a special symbolism, perhaps right after the reality was flesh and blood symbolized through bread and wine, the sacred heart does not draw to itself but refers to the devout to the deeper truth it symbolizes, like a Valentine's card. It's it's not just a little card, but what the person is trying to send us, his or her love or best wishes, or a condolence card, any manifestation in words of some sentiment that a person wants to share with somebody whom they love or care much about. The divine perfections are what arouse the greatest love, devotion, and imitation. God truly is worthy of being loved beyond all else. However, the weakness of a human being needs urging. He needs to be spurred on now and then in the quest for God. The mind is darkened and can be much helped by symbolism. Symbols are everywhere as the icons in order to penetrate the mystery of the living God. Human beings need to be conducted to the heights and depths of a divine mystery. As in the natural law, the scientists are invaded to study the imminent nature of inert matter and to rise up to the transcendent creator of all reality. So through symbols, formulations, and art, the human mind and heart can go up to God. We call these things monuments. Mm -hmm. The monuments of God's word, the monuments of a basilica, or to study early church architecture. You can often find in it a faith, what these people were trying to do, to throw the stones high into the sky in defiance of the law of gravity, in adoration. As we bow down, the rocks lift up and are thrust into the heavens by the law of construction to give praise to God. That makes me think of the very first time I went to St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome as a tourist was... Mm. 35 years ago mm-hmm. and it was not uh, a believer at the time mm-hmm. and just to walk into that mm-hmm. place mm-hmm. I remember what I said to mm-hmm. my husband no wonder people believe in God mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that there was something so compelling mm-hmm. about yeah. that monument mm-hmm. that it was um, it was a like a, a thrusting toward mm-hmm. faith that's a very interesting response that you had that time I remember when the Jubilee opened on January 1st, I think it was, it might have been the first Sunday of Advent or before that, but of the year 2000. At that time, John Paul was very weak physically and he was overcome by uh, 
Alzheimer's was Parkinson's, it? Parkinson's I believe he disease. had and he was le- opening the gold, the uh, jubilee door at midnight and he's holding on to his processional cross and with the when the door was opened he alone walked down the uh, the, the, the aisle it's not like the little baby we, baby we often see for New Year's Day. This was an old man for whom every step must have been agony. Mm-hmm. And there was a Jewish reporter there. He said, this is, makes me wish I could believe. Yeah, yeah. It was just this image of this, the symbolism that was so full and complete and so on. Anyway, some things strike some people and sometimes they don't. But anyway, it, it is an incident of life. So in the Sacred Heart Devotion, <clears throat> God is worshipped in a visible form and the faithful are raised up to the love of the invisible God. It's like a ladder or it's a springboard. The humanity of Christ has made art, the sacraments possible. We had no image of God before the Incarnation. It was, it was against religion. So both cause as well as inspired devotion to the highest levels in the history of the Church has been proven. The sacred humanity in general serves as a guide that takes the devout by the hand. Devotion takes this lead and penetrates as far as it is possible into the divine perfection, total self-giving, a total outlay of oneself on behalf of others. The sacred heart does indeed lead to contemplation, study, and experience of the divine love and mercy under the guidance of the church's magisterium. And therefore, the cross, the sacred heart, and other aspects of the sacred humanity, as the precious blood, lead to the love of the incarnate word of the Father and in the Holy Spirit. Under a variety of titles, prerogatives, aspects of his revealed mystery, Jesus is worshipped in the hearts of believers, in religious communities, groups within the church, bringing honor to the part of men and women to his person. I remember once reading a kind of a sad commentary on the position of the great Jesuit theologian and Father Karl Rana. A sister was showing how the title of the Sacred Heart Sisters, why it was changed, because it had no longer proved meaningful to so many. In a way, it was an indication that that form of the Sacred Heart devotion had faded. It was too saccharine or too uh, whatever. At any rate, today we have a great emphasis on mercy, which to me seems to be a development or continuing of the Sacred Heart devotion. So churches and groups and religious communities that had the Sacred Heart as a title are now more and more difficult to come by. Anyway, the whole devotion is an effort to look into the mystery of of the divinity as in a mirror or in darkness due to Christ's union within the Trinity as the only begotten, most beloved Son of the Father, born in time of the Immaculate Virgin. He remains the the splendor of the Father and the perfect copy of the divinity, as we read in in Hebrews 1. So much of this may seem like excessive verbiage, which I'm sure it is. But the fact is, the devotion to the Sacred Heart has played a a long time millennial, not centuries old, experience of some devotion to to God's love for humanity. And it has often inspired others to give their lives totally back to God. So in these reflections, we're trying to look at some of the aspects of the Trinity, and my voice is running out, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Well, Father, your voice has run out in exactly the right moment in time because we've come to the end of this reflection on the sacred heart and you've been able to share with us something of the richness of this of this symbol and this metaphor this meaning that that if we take the time to listen to what you have to say and to contemplate it um, it's really a wonderful thing I find myself as I as I as you talk, I wish I could hit the pause button so that I could keep thinking what I'm thinking before you go on. And that's a nice thing about these mm-hmm. about these reflections because our listeners can hit the pause button yeah, right. and they can think for a bit uh, and before you continue your commentary. It would make it all worthwhile if that could even happen in one case. I'm sure it does. Yeah. So will you finish us with a prayer today? Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. 
world without end. Amen. Mary, Mother of the Church, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.